Okay, in chapter 14, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, genomes and genomics. So we're going to, with genetics, we're looking at genes or small subset of genes and how they uh, lead to transcription and translation and the proteins that have function. Here we're going to talk about entire genomes and, and biology at a genomic or entire chromosome large scale compared to genetics. Here is the chapter outline for this chapter. So here we have a picture of a karyotype, and that is a kind of stained representation of all the chromosomes in the human genome. This is when the chromosomes are all bundled up uh, with their uh, secondary uh, into their secondary structure and not pulled apart for the purposes of uh, transcription and translation. And so for you medical professionals, this is going to be the karyotype that we're generally uh, going to be interested in. Um, obviously, for humans, we have 23 sets of chromosomes. They're diploid, so we have one set from your mother and one set from your father. But that's not necessarily true for other organisms. Uh, an organism such as corn is octoploid, so it gets four chromosomes from each of its parents, um, and it has a different number of chromosomes as well. Um, something like Drosophila uh, has, I believe, five chromosomes, and that's uh, 23. But again, it's a diploid organism, so it has uh, only two sets, one from each parent. So nowadays, it's easy for you to do genomic science um, because there are a lot of uh, reference genomes available. And so this is a complete uh, sequence of the entire genome of an organism, every single nucleotide mapped out in order along each chromosome. Um, so let's talk a little bit of about how we're going to or how this is possible. How do you obtain a genomic sequence? Well. You might say, oh, well, we put some primers on the ends of the genome and then we do a PCR and uh, let it walk. Or we do uh, with that termination uh, type sequencing that we saw in the earlier chapters of how to obtain uh, a sequence. Well, the problem is, is that P uh, polymerase generally when we use it in the context of PCR is good for a thousand or so base pairs before it degrades and it doesn't, um, it starts to integrate incorrect nucleotides. And we're talking of kilobases and kilobases of nucleotides that are in this genomic sequence. So for instance, we'll say this is uh, 500 kilobases long. So it's really long. So it's 500 times what one uh, polymerase can do. So the way we approach this is to cut the genome into random fragments. So we slice it up. Um, you can do this physically through uh, like shearing with uh, sonication or some sort of mechanical uh, breaking of the genome or through those restriction enzymes we talked about before and have them cut randomly. So now what we do is we sequence each one of these individual fragments. And so uh, in this case here, we have these red fragments that we sequence all of them. And then we sequence these green fragments, etc. And we look for overlaps. So when there's large amount of overlaps, we construct that into what's called a contig or a contiguous sequence. And so this isn't a sequence that is um, a full genome, but it's a large chunk, larger than one sequencing rung could do. So we're starting to build these into kind of like a scaffolding, right? And so in this case, we've done it so we have five contigs, and we can take those contigs, and we can look for overlap at the end of those contigs, just like we did with those individual sequences before, and start to kind of use overlapping sequences to build larger and larger sections until we get to an entire chromosome. Once we get to an entire chromosome, we can do it multiple times with each chromosome to go to an entire genome. Now, part of the sequencing problem, we have to do cloning. Remember we talked uh, back in the molecular methods chapter about yaks and, and backs and uh, phosmids and all these things that are made to hold these big chunks of DNA. Well, we need to do that to clone to get higher uh, concentrations of these fragments or higher uh, uh, amounts of DNA to actually do the work. If Otherwise, we're going to have to purify a ton of genomic DNA. It's a big mess. Uh, 
And so we need to clone those fragments. But remember, if you're going to do sequencing, you also need to know, have primers laid down. So if we were to try to sequence each individual uh, fragment that we created, we'd have to know where we fragmented it, which is going to be a problem because it's all random, and what primers are on the end of each of those fragments. We'd actually have to know the sequences as well. So it becomes a lot of, of issues with how we're going to uh, clone these fragments in order to do the sequencing. So what happens is we take these vectors, and remember, um, these vectors have those sites that have specific um, restriction enzyme recognition sites in them. And in those sites, we know that the DNA is going to be inserted there because they cause those sticky overhangs. And if we cut our genomic DNA with the same um, restriction enzyme, then we know that it's going to be inserted properly into that vector. Well, at the edges of that site, outside of where we cut, so say we, we cut in the middle, outside of where we cut, we have primer sites that we know where the prime or the exact sequence for priming a PCR or sequencing reaction. So what we do is we take every single one of those chunks and we stick them into one of these vectors. And so then we have our chunk where it was cut here, in the case of the lime green down here, the random piece of genomic DNA, and it ligates so that on the very ends, we have those primers that we need to do the sequencing. And so because we know those primers as well, when we do the sequencing, we can just ignore those sequences and, and remove them in the computer to say, we don't care about the primer sequences, we know them. We call them adapters as well. Genomic te uh, technologies move very, very fast. And so at the time of this book, um, pyrosequencing was a technique they talked about. Pyrosequencing is becoming less and less um, of a thing. It, there's new uh, genomic technologies that are coming out now that increase the, the size of your reads from um, a few hundred base pairs to thousands of base pairs. So each strand that you originally sequence is longer. Um, and so every time I teach this class, the newest, latest and greatest is going to be different. But we're going to talk about pyrosequencing here as our example. So pyrosequencing works um, where single strands of that template DNA that we've created are attached to these little beads. Then that DNA that was attached to the beads is amplified with PCR and then stuck back to the same bead. So we've got a lot of the exact same sequence that has been uh, adhered to these little tiny, tiny beads. Each one of those beads is put into an individual well on this uh, sequencing chip. So the DNA sequence on number one here, all those little hairs that it looks like hairs on that bead are the same, but they're distinct from the group of hairs that is not number two or number three or number four back here. So each well tells us something different. Now, each well, a DNA polymerase and a primer are added to each well. And then uh, each of those four uh, nucleotides, A, G, T, and C, are added to each wells one at a time. In between, they're washed out. So you add all A's, wash them out. Add all G's, wash them out, etc. in a sequence. And so when a nucleotide is complementary to the actual sequence that is on this bead. So in the case of this one, when the next in line is an A and a T, the round calls for a T to be added before it gets washed away, there is a phosphate molecule that is released and it causes this cascade, this molecular cascade that leads to a flash of fluorescence. There's an enzyme called luciferase that uh, is kind of uh, similar to the enzymes you see like in uh, fireflies that cause them to, to glow. And so this cascade from the incorporation of this nucleotide leads to um, luciferase, I'm sorry, um, uh, shining. 
And then we know that the sequence at that well, that must be a T in that spot. And so it's very hard for me to say this on a still picture. Um, so I'm actually in this week's um, uh, material on Moodle, I'm actually going to attach a video provided by, I believe, Illumina, who's one of the companies that makes all these sequencers. Um, and they have a really cool animated video that actually shows you how it works. So I encourage you to look at that to um, get a full view and really capture how this pyrosequencing works. So when that nucleotide is incorporated during pyrosequencing, over on the left side, the sun looking thing is our bead. And we have our single stranded um, piece of DNA that has been multiple or has been replicated multiple times. And so repeated additions will add an A, then a G, then a C, then a T, but in between we wash out any remnants. So we add A's, see if it fluoresces, and then remove them all if it doesn't. Even if it does, we just remove them all. We add G's, give it an opportunity to fluoresce if that's next in line, and then remove them all and do this over and over and over and over, right? And so in this case, we added a G with the second round of um, additions. And because the C was next in line, they covered it with an arrow that makes it kind of not intuitive, but that's a C. And the RNA polymerase adds it or tries to add it and it fits. It doesn't have to cut it back out. And so when that happens, it releases this phosphate molecule into the little reaction well that it's sitting in. And in there is this uh, enzyme called ATP sulfurylase. That's a mouthful. And um, what that does is it converts that phosphate molecule into ATP, which is the required fuel for luciferase to glow. So we know then when we round, uh, added G to the well in this time, that the next amino acid in line was G. And so the computer takes note of that, adds it to the sequence for that well, and moves on. So the next amino acid that would be added here is C, right? So in the order, it's C. So it'll add C, but that template is calling for an A. So when it adds C, there's no flash. And so the computer makes no note because it knows that C wasn't the proper one. Then I'll add T and there'll be no flash. And then it gets rid of all the T's. Then it adds A and there's a flash. And so then we know that we have C then A in line for this. And it goes through this over and over in all those different wells to give us a whole bunch of sequences. Like I said, there's a cool video I'm posting. Watch the video, it's really well done. Uh, the narrator's a little boring, but at least uh, it's real short. It just gives you an idea of how this works. So remember, we're getting the genomic DNA here. We're not getting uh, cDNA, which was only the DNA that turns into proteins. We're not getting RNA, which is that same thing, the um, message sent from the genes to the protein. We're getting everything from the DNA, the chromosomes itself. And so this contains a lot of information beyond just the genes, right? And so from this, we can glean uh, the regulatory regions where the proteins um, like the um, activators and repressors bind. Um, we can find the sites, the promoters, where um, RNA polymerase binds to, those five prime UTRs, all the introns and the exons, uh, the three prime UTR, the site where those poly A tails are added, etc. So there's a lot of information there. And What's interesting is that a lot of these little regions have very conserved sequences. So what we can do is take that raw geno uh, genomic code of just millions of base pairs, A, T, G, G, A, T, C, over like long, long stretches, and we can run it through computers. And this, is, uh, this field is bioinformatics. And what we can do is we can take that raw sequence and we can predict where genes are based on these conserved sequences. So say this is just an example, but say that every promoter started with five specific nucleotides. It started with A, T, G, A, T. Um, and so every time we see that, we can say, oh, maybe this is a gene. 
And then from there, we can look at some of our other predictors and see if that's a gene. Even though we might not know anything about what that gene does, we can predict whether or not uh, that sequence is a gene or not. So on top of that, we can add kind of a second layer of annotation. So remember those cDNA libraries. Well, those are only sequences that the exons contribute to. Remember the introns are those regions in between exons in a gene that are cut out and they don't lead to the formation of a protein. Well, we can determine what introns and exons are by using a cDNA library of that same organism. So if we sequence the cDNA, we know, say this is a sequence of A, T, C, 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 etc. Now we can try to map that cDNA back onto the reference genome or the human genome. And we see that we have an A, T, C, C, C here. And so we're like, oh, this is where that gene is, and that's the protein uh, part of it. But when we're sequencing the cDNA, it would just continue uninterrupted to this, say, four T's in a row, T, 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 T. But when we look at the reference genome, there's something different here. And then we have T, 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 T further down the line. So then what we can posit from that is, okay, well, this region in between, it all lines up eventually, but this region in between right here, that must have been an intron that was sliced out. So when we look at the cDNA, we have A, T, C, 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 T, 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 but we look at the genomic DNA, we have that A, T, C, 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 then a bunch of random nucleotides, then that T, 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 T. So this mapping the cDNA back onto the genomic DNA uh, is a way that we can determine where the introns and exons are on genomic DNA. As I kind of buried the lead in a previous slide, um, these map of genomic regions uh, we do with computers and we have algorithms that will look at specific sequences and predict whether or not they are just an unknown function or what they used to call junk DNA, that DNA that is just kind of in between these regions, um, or if they are something important for uh, this gene. And so what we can do is from this information is predict things like these uh, RNA polymerase binding sites. Um, we can predict the introns and exons using that cDNA information that we talked about. Um, we can predict translation initiation sites and promoters. And on top of that, we can take it one step further. Once we know okay, this is the exons, and this is the introns, and this is the promoter, we can predict what that primary RNA uh, transcript is going to be. We can predict what those splice sites are, so we can then predict what the actual processed RNA, mRNA is. So this is the mRNA that has been altered by the spliceosome to no longer have the introns in it. And we can even then go and predict what that protein's polypeptide sequence is going to be based on what the codons are in that mRNA. So this field of bioinformatics is very, very predictive, and it's it's very uh, a very useful tool if you are trying to get started with looking at genes and how um, this gene may play a role in the question you're asking. Um, and it just gives a wealth of information. However, one caveat. I'm a big proponent of bioinformatics. I do a lot of RNA sequencing and looking at genomic questions but you always need to take that um, predictive information with bioinformatics and test it out. Because like I had said, these are all theoretical algorithms and they're getting better and better and we can predict more and more things. However, there's always new things that we're finding. Like I mentioned throughout uh, this class, we used to refer to regions of DNA that we didn't know the function as junk DNA. And this was supposedly regions um, that didn't make protein and weren't promoter binding sites and thus didn't have any role in, in the organism. We're finding out more and more that these are regulatory regions. They're used for binding in histones and methylation sites and all this epigenetic stuff, all this really cool, crazy stuff. Um, and so 
sometimes you might predict something to be a gene and we'll find out that there was some rule that we didn't know when predicting genes that says it's not. Um, so everything should always be tested in the lab af afterwards with an experiment. If you think, for example, this gene is what causes uh, Parkinson's in people, then um, a thorough researcher would then take that gene, mutate it in a mouse, uh, for instance, like we saw in our, our previous methods chapter, and then see if those similar symptoms come up. So going further and predicting what a gene is, there's a lot of evidence that is required to make accurate gene predictions. So the first thing is blast similarity. So as you know from evolution, there are organisms that are very similar to each other. And you hear this all the time that humans have 99.9% .9 the same DNA as a chimpanzee, and that's true. And so if we were to look at the human genome, and assuming we had not done any work with it, we just got the full sequence, and now we want to predict what genes are involved, or what genes are in this uh, geno or genome of, of humans. And we do have an annotated chimp DNA uh, genome, what we can do is we can compare the human genome to the chimpanzee genome. And anything that looks like a gene in chimpanzees that we find in the human genome is most likely a gene. If it's a gene in chimpanzees, because we're 99.99% .99 similar, or whatever the, the going rate is on, on comparing humans and chimps, then it's likely that that gene we were predicting in humans was like an evolutionarily common gene between the two of us. So we can look at all the previously uh, predicted genes from all the different organisms, and because evolution means that we've had common descent from common ancestors, that uh, we would have similar genes. So that's one tool that we can use. Again, um, there are sequence motifs. So this is the cDNA. Uh, ESTs are express sequence tags. Those are kind of similar to cNA. I'm not going to get too much into those. Um, but cDNA libraries, that will, again, help us to determine what introns and exons are. Um, this is a really cool one. At least I find it cool. Codon bias. So in different organisms, remember if we go back to that amino acid table from a few chapters ago, there are a lot of overlap where, for example, leucine, I think, has four, maybe six, four or six codons that um, will code for leucine. But however, there's this thing called codon usage bias. And so say in humans, even though there's six possible codons that will code that tRNA to go get a leucine, really, because of codon usage bias, different organisms tend to use only a couple of those six. So in humans, say A, G, G, and A, T, T were two of the six possible leucine codons. Now, every time a codon is called for in humans, codon usage bias would say that we primarily use those two instead of the other four or all six. Because what that means then is when we have tRNA floating around, that's less resources that needs to be incorporated to creating all six of those tRNA. Why do we need to make all six of those tRNA for leucine if we can just make two of them and still incorporate the right amino acid, right? So uh, this is kind of an evolutionary factor where um, the codons used we don't generally use all 20 plus of the tRNA or of those codons in that table. We usually, all organisms usually use only a small number or a couple for each amino acid. So all that being said, when we are predicting a gene, if for some reason for every leucine, it is using a codon that doesn't go with our codon bias. It's a completely new one that the rest of the genes in the genome don't use, then we're probably not predicting a gene. That's probably something else. If it 
looks like a gene, it blasts like a gene, it has cDNA like a gene, and it uses all the same codons as the rest of the genome, then it's more likely to be a gene. And then again, on top of this information, we can add our predicted splice sites. Um, we remember the splice sites we remember are uh, AGGU, and it cuts between the two Gs, um, between introns and exons. So we can add that information. And what we end up with is our predicted gene, where we have the uh, UTR, the exons, the introns, etc. Now, when we start compiling all of this information together, we get these very big, extensive, dense maps of a chromosome. So here's that original karyotype here of our uh, diploid uh, chromosome from that technicolored picture we looked at in, in the beginning. But you can see we have all this information put down where we have, um, if you were to, to zoom in, you could actually look at the sequence. Um, you can see some of these things are like how um, confident they are that that is the sequence. Um, we can see, or if there's SNPs or multiple different um, um, splice vari or not splice variation, nucleotide variation, so small nucleotide polymorphisms there. Because remember, even though we have the human genome, individuals still have different mutations, otherwise we'd all look exactly the same. So these are relative um, sequences where you know everyone's going to have quite a few mutations in different spots, but it's still the genes still are acting the same way in each one. Um, but from there, you can also see we have uh, the names of the genes, et cetera. So you get these very big, dense, high amounts of information maps of the genome of a, of a person. So <clears throat> on top of this, what we can do is compare genomes too. So comparative genomics uh, allows us to look at entire genomes from multiple different organisms and gives us insight into which genes are preserved through the process of evolution, but also can tell us who are like really closely related common ancestors. And some of this stuff's very interesting to me because, uh, for example, I went to a talk um, in Baton Rouge at LSU recently, and there was a scientist there, and I, I forget where he was from, um, but he gave a very interesting talk on turtles. And turtles are near and dear to my heart. Um, I have a few turtles. Um, and um, he was trying to uncover where turtles fall evolutionarily in this tree of life, in these amniotes. And so turtles in this picture, we have them um, closely related to, um, uh, this looks like a bearded dragon, um, and uh, snakes, but further than a related cousins would be crocodiles. Well, with their information, they were seeing that maybe instead turtles are more closely related to uh, birds and crocodiles than they are to lizards and snakes. And so a lot of this stuff is not set in stone yet, and we're still learning a lot about how uh, everybody fits in the tree of life, and it's constantly changing. Um, but this is something that by comparing entire genomes, it used to be we do this taxonomically, right? So we'd look and say, okay, snakes have got to be very far distant because somehow they lost all their legs. And uh, crocodiles and lizards, they look pretty similar, so those must be closely related. But now we can use genomic information to find out because just because something drastic like losing legs happen doesn't mean that it's something further related because there could be a whole bunch of subtle changes um, that we don't see um, as apparently as legs um, that make them more distantly related. If you're interested in the stuff specifically in this branch of the uh, tree of life, um, Dr. Shepard teaches a cool herpetology class, um, and I believe they do um, kind of taxonomy uh, and phylo, uh, I don't know if he does phylogenetics exactly, but they talk about phylogenies and things of that nature and how these different organisms are related. Um, I've heard nothing but good things of that class, so uh, I'm not a phylogeneticist um, in any stretch, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so if you're interested in that, take uh, Dr. Shepard's uh, herp class. It's, it's quite good. When we compare DNA of us to other uh, species, we can see relics of evolution that are also preserved here. And so in this example here, we have chickens, uh, we have humans, and we have platypus. Now, humans and platypus are mammals, and chickens are not mammals, right? They're birds. 
So chickens have these three genes for laying conventional eggs, right? Uh, so the eggs you get, get at the supermarket, etc. Now, humans don't lay eggs, but there are a couple very weird mammals that instead of having birth by uh, being inside, you know, inside your body birth, uh, they lay eggs as well, and the platypus is one of them. So there's a couple different ways that we can look at how these traits evolved. One way would it be to say that, okay, our common ancestors, because at one point we all share a common ancestor between chicken, human, and uh, a platypus, and we could say that, okay, the chicken evolved or gained this ability to create eggs through the yolk genes, and humans never gained it, and that uh, the platypus also gained it in a separate evolutionary event. And so we would have two evolutionary events that occurred. Humans didn't have anything evolve. Chickens had these three genes rise up, and then uh, the platypus had a single gene rise up. So each individual had an event or a couple of events in the case of chicken. Now, a more simple example, or explanation I should say for this, is that the common ancestor of humans, chicken, and platypus, that was an egg-laying individual. And that instead, humans had lost the genes to lay eggs. So here we see that we have these pseudogenes, so they're not functional genes anymore, but they look a lot like the chicken genes do. And that the chicken and the platypus remained. So in that explanation, then only one individual had some evolutionary change as opposed to two individuals. And so this process of picking the most basic and the explanation that takes the least amount of steps is called parsimony. So it's the idea that the most basic explanation is most likely the most correct um, explanation. So, and we actually see this in humans. So in humans, uh, there are some pseudogenes that bear resemblance to the yolk genes in chicken. Um, the platypus has uh, yolk gene one that looks a lot like uh, yolk, gene, uh, yolk gene two in chicken and also contains a couple of genes that no longer function. In humans, it looks like we just lost those genes. We don't need them anymore because the way that, that humans reproduce has changed. And so um, through this evolutionary, these genomic techniques comparing different animals' genomes, we can also see which genes were gained and lost uh, through the evolution of organisms. So we can use these different computer models to say where proteins are gonna bind to. Um, and like I said, you need to also confirm this because those computer models aren't perfect yet. And so it's always good science to go into the lab and see if you make changes or see if you can observe these proteins in those spots that you predicted. And one way to do this is through what's called a chip assay, which is a chromatin amino precipitation assay. And so in this, we take um, DNA that's in the cell and we kind of freeze it in place. We do this uh, chemically treat it and it will cross link those proteins to the DNA. So it won't, it'll like say freeze and it'll make sure that they are not leaving the DNA that they were bound to. So then what we do is we take um, the DNA and we break it into small pieces with that chromatin or those uh, proteins attached to the DNA still. And from there, depending on what type of protein we're looking at, whether it's a transcription factor or chromatin, uh, in this case, it's chromatin because we're doing chromatin amino precip uh, precipitation assays, um, but we can create an antibody that is specific to that one protein. And so from there, we can purify out all the pieces of DNA that that pro type of protein is bound to and all the other cross-linked proteins in DNA, we just wash those away because we don't really care about them in this experiment. And then what we can do is we can reverse that cross-linking. So we then remove all of the proteins that were bound to the DNA and completely get rid of those proteins. Because we know the proteins exist, we don't care about them we just care about where they're going, right? So we remove all those proteins, we wash them away, and we're left with just these sequences where those proteins were bound. And so 
these are those sequences that we may have predicted with our computer models earlier. And so what we do then is we sequence that and see if those sequences match what we had predicted earlier with our computer models. If they don't, then we can add that information to our models to predict better because obviously we were missing some of these sequences when we were predicting uh, because we physically found uh, sequences that were bound uh, in this uh, chip assay. So the last thing I'm going to mention for this chapter, this is very brief, is that uh, we can also use targeted mutagenesis. Now remember, if you go back to the example from our molecular methods chapter with the mouse, where we inserted that canamycin gene into a normal gene to break it um, and use that as a selectable marker, well, that would be a way to confirm whether or not what you predicted was a gene or not, because you could physically see the changes in the offspring mice. Well, we, this is just kind of a simplized version of that. We can take um, gene sequences that are homologous, so they are uh, complementary to one another, these two green sections here, and uh, the two green sections on the other side. And in our vector that we've introduced, we've also put a big chunk of whether it's a selectable marker or just random DNA that's going to break the protein or anything of that nature, um, we have that in the middle. So when this is actually sequenced, it's not going to be the proper protein because we have a bunch of weird nucleotides that aren't supposed to be there. And so we then introduce this into the organism and we hope that through uh, recombination that our mutant gene then gets inserted into the DNA in its place, the host's chromosome, and that will break that gene. And so a predicted gene that we had previously from our computer models, we can use this targeted mutagenesis where we know the sequence because we predicted it with that computer model. So we get that sequence and then we put something in the middle to break it. Uh, and then we put it in the organism and then see if we were right, if that's a gene. If we predicted that was a gene similar to uh, hair color in apes. If we break it in the lab and we see that, you know, this mouse or whatever we used as our model has a different hair color all of a sudden, then we're pretty confident that we predicted correctly and that gene actually does have uh, to do with hair color. So that's it for this chapter. Uh, we're getting close to the end of the semester, so keep powering through.